morning, everyone. I see a few people yawning in already. We'll get started in just a few minutes here. Ahead and share my screen. Can you guys hear me and see the screen okay? Feel free to pop in a little message in the chat there. Thank you so much. Appreciate that, Willie. Good stuff. Right, if you guys have any questions already, please put them in the Q&A window and I'll be happy to answer them. So let's just start here. All right, let's see some questions there. Perfect. I will get to them. Um, in a bit. All right, I think it, it's time. I'm gonna go ahead and start the screen. The stream, not screen. Have the phone real quick so I have a chance to see the screen kicking in. Right, going to start the screen. Screen now. Right, we are live. Welcome so much to the last office hour for year 2021. An hour where you can ask any questions on MBT, config manager, Intune, imaging, Windows, whatnot. My name is Johan. I'll be host the next hour. And as usual, please post your questions in the Q&A window here in the Zoom meeting. Uh, if you are attending on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, I am monitoring those chats as well. Uh, but it usually takes me a few minutes extra to get to those. But I'm going to open up that chat window real quick. And I'm going to switch over to this view here and this view here. So hopefully that will come through. All right. Let me just a second. There I have the chat window. Perfect. All 
All right, I see there is a few questions coming in uh, already. Uh, there is one from Willie here regarding reference images. So the scenario is basically, uh, he has a Windows 10 uh, VM that is uh, running a sysprep and capture up. And this is, of course, required for organizations that still are using, you know, thicker images. And the question is, how can I get a registry key in that sysprep have a sort of a tendency to uh, delete for me? Well, basically you have a, a few different options here. So sysprep, as you probably know, will actually clean out a lot of stuff on your machines. And sometimes if you want to keep something, well, you will have to add it back after sysprep has removed it because there is no setting in sysprep to say, hey, exclude this particular registry key or skip this particular cleaning part. Uh, this simply doesn't exist. So what you can do, and I'm going to go over to my demo machine here real quick. Um, let's see here, MVT1. Uh, that's not that one. Uh, I wasn't asking a question on Twitter earlier regarding indexes. That's why this one is up. But if I go to my deployment workbench, and I'm going to go on to one of my building capture sequences for uh, Windows 10, I'm going to do this one here. And as you can see um, in the bottom here, uh, it does run script, and then it applies WinP to the hard drive, and then it reboots the machine, and after that, you capture it. If you want to inject something, you can actually do that before sysprep starts. Uh, sorry, just the machine restarts. So you can add a little script here that janks in that registry key. And then uh, since sysprep has already run at that point, uh, as long as it's a fairly harmless registry key, it won't do anything. So that's something you can do, put a script right after the sysprep has completed. If, uh, because the machine can be in a little bit of a limbo when sysprep is run, what you also can do is that you can uh, add it here. Because after reboot, the machine comes in in WinPE, but just before it creates the WIM file, you can actually do offline injections as well. So if there is something in Windows that prevents you from running the script here, you can always go ahead and run it here and mount the registry offline. Um, I did write a little script for that because that is not so easy uh, as doing it when Windows is running. Here. So here is a little PowerShell snippet that simply figures out where the Windows uh, uh, installation is. So it sets that as a variable and then it mounts the registry key offline, doesn't change this to it, and then uh, that's a bit of cleanup. Uh, you need to do this, otherwise you get an access denied. And then it downloads the registry hive here. So I'll put that link in the chat for you guys. So you have it. So I hope that answered that question. Uh, all right. There is another question here. Uh, let's see. I was going through your blog and scripts on adding Dart to config manager boot image and starting it earlier and early. Uh, where in the sequence should this be added to the other 10 file as well? So you need this to implement then fixy what happens. Uh, so there is no need to add this to the under 10 template uh, that the sequence uses. This one only needs to go into the boot image. So in my environment here, and uh, let me first show you the, the blog post in question that, that the uh, question was related to. Uh, as a background to this, Config Manager has a native option of adding in Dart so that you can remote into WinPE during deployment. It, that feature comes with the MDT integration if you have that one installed or, or configured. Uh, however, 
the way they added it, I think it's wrong because they added it about two minutes into a sequence. I wanted it to be available right away so I can remote in for troubleshooting purposes. So that's why I revived a little script I wrote like 10 years ago, back in 2011, uh, before there was any integration at all. And I just made a PowerShell version of that script. And the way that script works is that it starts, let's see here. Uh, it starts through the NLTN file that goes into boot image. It does not use any templates later on on the, on the window side of things. But it starts the script here that simply connects to the event service in MDT and report that, hey, I have a client here that you can remote into. But the script that actually does the injection is this one here. And the only thing you need to do is to take one of your boot images that you have enabled for Pixie and set it as a name here. So if I go to my server uh, here and go to one of my sequences, uh, oh, both images, not sequences. This is the boot image where I added Dart 2. And this one is also configured to be enabled for Pixie. And that means when I do an F12 to Pixie boot, that machine will now automatically, I'm going to close this one, will automatically show up in the monitoring tab here. Uh, and I can remote into it from here. So as long as those files are in the boot image, it will work on both boot media, ISO files, or Pixie. There is no different configuration that needs to be done. So I hope I answered that uh, question. Um, good morning, Christian. Got a little greeting there on Facebook. Um, any other questions? Great questions, by the way. Andrew has joined as well. He's my partner in crime for a lot of the courses we do here on the Academy, primarily config manager and intune courses. Morning, Andrew. So any other questions? Right, while we're waiting for more questions to come in, uh, I do like to just friendly reminder that we did a free mini course just before Christmas regarding everything peer to peer, branch cache, peer cache, uh, deliver optimization, bits, lab bat, and a few other cool things. And that recording is now available. So if you're looking for something to do this week, uh, simply dive into that course, check the recording, and you will learn about all this good stuff here. So great opportunity to uh, do this here. All right. Uh, good morning to you, Matt, as well. Thank you for that greeting. Let's see, there is another question coming in. How would you know, and that goes back to the Dart post earlier. How would you know what scripts to run if you have enabled Dart and F12 on the properties of the TS. So the trick to get the whole thing going is that the PowerShell script that I showed you, I have one available here as well. And This script just extracts the dot components and injects them into the boot image. So it actually borrows the dot cab file and the dot config file from MDT together with the script and the NL10 file, mounts the boot image and just smacks the files into the boot image. And then that part is done. When you boot that one, that's when the NL10 XML file is used. And that one sits in the root of the boot image. 
and it's simply start that script and the script takes parameters to what service to report to and what the name should be when I do a deployment. So let's see if I can build some machines just to show you what I mean. Uh, it's going to do some cleanup. I have a feeling I have a few half deployed machines, not that one, that's good. Yeah, get rid of those two friends. All right, so if I go to one of my clients, um, can find one. I have a few VMs on this one. Are my Pixie clients here, right in front of my? So I'm just going to move this one to a different network where I have uh, IP helpers for that particular Pixie server. So I'm going to do a Pixie deployment of this guy right here. Let's see what happens. I mean, what can possibly go wrong in a live demo? Let's see what happens. I hope I'm not running out of memory on this one. Oh, not yet, but I'm getting close to. Come on, Hyper-V. It's not that hard to start a VM. I have disk space. I have disk space. Entirely sure why this one is taking so here we go. I All right, so now I'm downloading the boot image, and as you can see here, it's uh Boot image number six, so the package ID is number six. And that boot image is the one that I had here in my console. So this is the one with number six. And that was the one I added the art component to. So if I go back to that machine, wait until it downloads. To give you an idea here, my demo network is interesting, but I have a fairly large demo setup with tons of different routers and gateways and physical virtual machines in the mix. So basically allows me to more or less simulate any type of scenario that a lot of our customers are are running into. So I also have three different config man environments, uh, one with full PKI, with, with HTTPS with, uh, or with enhanced HTTP, and another one for technical preview in tests. But yeah, it's fun. Let's see here. Boot image is coming down. And what should happen now is that since this boot image has an under town file in the root of it, it's going to try to, to actually get some things going here. So I'm going to do an F8. And if you look at the left hand corner here, this is the Dart recovery now waiting. Ticket number, IP address, and port number. And the, way that, the thing that started this was the very fact that I had this annotation file in the road to the boot image. Config map by default doesn't have one, but you can add one. And that's very useful if you want to start things before config map does anything uh, on its own. So, that means that I can actually go to my server now 
or any machine where you have the console installed, hit refresh, and that machine will now show there. And you saw the step name booted into WinPE. And from here, I can double click and I can do a, a remote control session of that machine. This has been extremely useful when testing drivers, when testing BIOS configurations, BIOS updates. Uh, I was troubleshooting a, a modern BIOS management uh, setup this morning, this way through Dart. So it's good stuff, but it allows you to continue and, and do whatever you need to do to start your deployments and whatnot. So quite useful feature, I have to say. All right. So I hope I answered that question. Let's see. Matt had another one regarding uh, the toast notification script. So one of the um, MVPs in Denmark, Martin Bengtsson, he has written uh, for years and kept updating uh, a toast notification that can be used for, for example, in place upgrades or, or uh, similar things. So Martin, post notifications, I uh, should take you right to that one. This is his uh, GitHub page. Let's see where the blog is. I know that soon I has to link to Martin's blog on his post about this. Here, there we go. And this is also an example for low disk space. Uh, using Toast. But the question is, can we customize this? Yes, this is just PowerShell. Uh, so you can put anything you like here, different images, different texts, whatnot. And as you can see a bit down here in the history, this script has been, I, I mean, Martin must have spent, I don't know how many hundred hours on this, but uh, he's done a lot of work with this one. So again, just PowerShell, you can customize, you can change. Um, I was talking to one uh, organization I work with, uh, uh, a bank that used this uh, basically for, for simple notifications, but they didn't want to have to download the images. So they actually encoded the images as like base64 encoding and put them in the PowerShell script itself. So as long as the image is not massive, of course, that's something you can do also. Um, it's actually not too uncommon to, to put in some extra payloads into scripts, uh, even binary payloads. That's what a lot of uh, creative hackers around the globe has been using to, to get stuff into environments they shouldn't. But you can also use that for useful stuff. Uh, do good things. But yeah, it's a great one. I'll put the link in, in the chat there for you. Um, so if you haven't seen this, uh, fantastic work. All right, let's see what else we have. I have a question from Matt on LinkedIn. Uh, okay, I have a customer currently running Windows 10 20 H2. And they are asking whether they should go 21 H2 Windows 10 or to Windows 11. I would like to know your thoughts on that. So fun story is that I was actually, yesterday morning, I was uh, writing up like a year in review for our newsletter that is going out tomorrow. And I, I touched these questions a little bit there as well. Bottom line is that most organizations, their hardware won't run Windows 11. The latest number I've heard is that on average, 40% of hardware for enterprise organizations will not run Windows 11. The other 60% will, but the 40% will not. And there are some bugs that need to be fixed in Windows 11. Uh, there is still a lingering VPN bugs, for example. And the OEMs are not yet up to pace with their tools and their solutions for Windows 11. Drivers are barely available for Windows 11. So I would not wreck any organization right now to start to do Windows 11 in like a production scale deployment. If you want to play around and test for that, perfectly fine. But my prediction for 
2022 is that organizations, most of them are going to stick to Windows 10. Because if you are in 2004 or later, it's so easy to update to 21H2, just a tiny enablement patch, two or three minutes, done, download, restart, complete it. Uh, to go to Windows 11 is a full upgrade. Uh, takes an hour at best. I have to download a four gig WIM file and, and stuff like that. So I would recommend to take the year 2022 to test and evaluate Windows 11 and see what's going on there, but continue to do Windows 10 for regular production deployment. So basically go after Windows 10 21 H2. Um, as every time Microsoft releases a new version of Windows, it takes a little while for it to get solid. I know a few organizations that actually love the new changes in Windows 11 so much, the UI, the, the bigger, uh, the higher security standards. So they actually jumped on that wagon, but I don't see everybody doing that. Um, and my recommendation is, is still to stick around on Windows 10 and evaluate Windows 11 going forward. Uh, Jan is asking, what was that VPN bug in Windows 11? It's an always on VPN bug. Uh, Richard Higgs, uh, uh, the author of uh, the Always VPN book, he has been blogging or tweeting quite a bit about this. Um, see if I can find any of those for you. Um, So Richard here, uh, amazingly good book, by the way, you should buy it if you don't have it, but he has been uh, tweeting about and blogging about these uh, uh, things. So highly recommend visit his blog. Um, see if you can find anything there. Oh, not now, thank you. Search for something. Oh, that's an older one. Um, what Google can tell us? I don't think he's and what this gives me. No. I know it was there somewhere. So I'll put that link in the chat for you guys so you have it. All right. All right, let's see what else. Uh, sensor is asking, uh, do we get an invoice for European companies when they buy all access passes? Yeah, we'll be happy to provide invoices. Uh, the only requirement we have is that before uh, you get access to the academy itself, that invoice has to be paid. That's all. But we, we, are, we are based in the US, but we accept global payments from, from anywhere if you cannot use a credit card on the on the site. So that works. Great question, by the way. All right, let's see what else we have here. It's a question regarding Windows 10 1909 uh, and this particular December update. Okay, 
basically, can I explain something in a link? Uh, So I, I'm guessing that the question is regarding end of life for Windows 10 1909. And uh, indeed, uh, uh, Windows 10 uh, 1909 expires on, on May 10 next year. And that does mean you will not get any updates after that. You will have to upgrade to uh, actually not this one, but uh, this one, this one, and or this one. I would definitely pick this one and then go to that one. Uh, fun fact is that that day is actually before my birthday, the day before my birthday last year, I decided to expire. No, this year they expired in 1903 on my birthday, which I think was a nice touch. Maybe it was 1809. May have been 1809. Must have been 1809. Anyhow, this one is where you should be on, not this one. And unfortunately, if you are on 1909, this is a full in-place upgrade. But hopefully it's the last full in-place upgrade you have to do in a while. Because all these versions here, they are just enablement packages. Boom, done. Same drivers, same everything, easy. Uh, Will is asking, have I tried upgrade 1909 to 21H2 using Config Manager? Absolutely, yes. It's a very tested scenario, even though it's fairly new. <clears throat> and that is because basically these versions here, they're the same. But you can go all the way from 1909 to here in one single go uh, using Config Manager. I've only tried it using sequences, uh, but I cannot see why servicing plans would not work if you guys are using those for upgrades. Intune also works this way uh, for that matter. So not too bad. So Matt, I hope I asked your question regarding the end of life for uh, 1909. And I hope I answered the other question there on upgrading. So let's see what else we have. Egmont is on YouTube is asking, uh, uh, well, first of all, how I'm doing. I'm not doing great, thank you. Appreciate that. I hope you're okay too. And the question was regarding uh, using MDT in a multi-tenant environment. Uh, with multi-tenant, I'm assuming multiple domains because MDT doesn't have any integration at all with Intune uh, or Azure Active Directory for that matter. Um, but it's very straightforward to use MDT with multiple servers for multiple domains. There are either built-in options in the wizard itself, or you can have it to show you a drop-down on what domain to pick. So they call it the specified domain OU.xml, and that will now give you a drop-down for that one. Uh, let's see. So without the S. Uh, And this has been like this since forever. You specify these information or an XML file. And then when you do a deployment, uh, it will give you a drop down of either a domain or in this case, OUs in the environment. Uh, if you don't like that wizard, you can do uh, your own wizard and customize it. Um, me and Michael Nystrom, a good friend of mine, we've been working on some PowerShell extensions for MVT lately, where we built our own wizard uh, in pure PowerShell and used that to drive our deployments. Um, that was basically there to enable peer-to-peer -peer for performance and to be able to do deployment over HTTPS. 
So we can have a single VM somewhere running a web server and we can do all deployments on that one. And of course that one doesn't care how many forests or how many domains you have. It simply downloads the stuff and, and, and give you that access. So um, my recommendation would be to, I mean, if you're a distributed environment, uh, either leverage peer-to-peer -peer capabilities or start to scale out with uh, multiple MDT servers in your different uh, and different sites. In this case, maybe different organizations since there's multiple tenant, multi-tenant. And then you can simply use the bootstrap inner file to redirect clients to the right uh, deployment server. So that would look something like this. Uh, where you leverage uh, default gateway information to basically direct machines to different deployment servers, depending on where they are, what network they belong to, they get redirected to the right server. For those of you running Config Manager, Config Manager deals with this on its own, but in MDT, you have to actually set this up. Uh, if you replicate out your deployment shares in MDT, I highly, highly recommend that you do first a local linked share here on the same server, and then use the FSR in a hub and spoke model to actually distribute that uh, out there. Um, I did write some documentation a while ago that got published on what was called TechNet at the time, but it's now up on the doc site. So let's see. Here you have something that you can, can uh, work on for MDT. Putting that link in the Zoom chat and these links will be available also up on the site uh, after when the recording is being uploaded as well. Um, so if you want to get access to links and to sort of be part of the Zoom meeting, uh, you can always log in to, uh, where the heck did it go? Uh, the office hours uh, page to so just sign up and then there will be a link where you can add access to Zoom meeting also. So different options to attend. Uh, there was a follow-up question regarding the multi-tenant and MDT, uh, but to get an MDT share per domain, it doesn't have to be. You can have a single deployment server for all the domains. For example, here, this deployment server number three, this is actually a workbook machine. I can deploy machines from this workbook computer to any domain I like. The only thing that needs to be configured is, all right, for this particular network, what should be the domain uh, the machine joins into? What should be the, uh, you know, uh, OU and, and things like that. So that's something you can define. And since it's using rules, you can have different for different locations. You can ask for this during deployment. Uh, it's, it's fairly easy to get going. All right, let's see. Matt is asking regarding 
1909 KBs. Assuming that was the same link we were on earlier. Question about the specific hotfix, let's see. 206. I do not find that one on that page, but I can see if I can find it on. Uh, ASIC site. Uh, yeah, this is the December one, 19 or three or later. Um, I'm not quite, I'm following the question. Uh, I only had one cup of coffee this morning, so you have to excuse me if I'm a little bit slow. I not quite understand the question. I think it's around for how long 1909 will receive updates. And as far as I know, Windows 10 is going to receive updates for uh, another six months here. So including L5, uh, including the May update. May update is going to be the last. I did see some discussion on Twitter uh, last night at some point where they were discussing release information for updates. I wonder if I can find that one. Might be a reply. I think it was this one. But that was the page we were on. Are the folks chiming in uh, into this? Community posts. Ah, my search skills are failing me at the moment. Something, something for nerds. Someone has figured out a way to get a list of those updates. Right, Gary Block had one. On here to get the information about the updates. And then there was another community solution. Uh, I love, <laughs> love the name, but uh, these are basically storing information about all updates that are available. So I'll get that link in the chat for you. As well as this one here. From Mr. Gary. All right.
So there was also a question regarding performance issues in IIS when running WSUS for a config manager environment. Do you have any practices there or ideas? Oh, I do, uh, many. Um, um, back in when WSUS were having uh, some quite interesting challenges uh, a few years back. Uh, the community came together and, and provided a large set of solutions that ended up in this particular blog post. I basically summarized a lot of stuff that, that can be done to make WSAS a little bit more happy in a config man environment. So first of all, make sure that the application pool is configured the way it should be and default settings are simply no good. Uh, I got lazy after a while and instead of clicking around like a little maniac here in the, in the console, uh, I wrote up a, um, a PowerShell script that provides what I consider like a starter type setting for any WSL server running on a config mag environment. And this will actually speed up the performance quite a bit um, in the environment. So recommend that one. I'll put that link in the chat for you. Uh, another item to this is make sure that you have regular maintenance going on for the database and that you uh, don't download more updates than you have to and that you have these maintenance jobs scheduled. Um, so if I go here, Open up Server Management Studio. This is a Server 2017 SQL, but a newer Management Studio. But, but as you can see here, I have implemented uh, Ola Hallengren's maintenance solution where I do run uh, index optimizers on databases on, on a weekly uh, schedule. And all these combinations of reducing the number of updates, do some cleaning, um, uh, it really helps performance um, in, in, a, in a sub. So, I mean, an absolutely shameless plug if you really are interested in that. There happened to be a training that covers all that good stuff. And I happen to be the presenter together with Mr. Andrew that is lurking here somewhere in, in, in the chat. So, but there is a lot of good information out there. Uh, I, I've said this many, many times. I absolutely love the config management community, how willing they are to help uh, and provide good resources um, for config manager setups. All right, let's see what else. Some of the usual spam showing up on the YouTube uh, chat. Not sure what's going on there. Some weird comments showing up every now and then. I have a feeling it's a bot. It was funny. I put my blog, this one here, uh, because I got tired of all the spams. I put it behind Cloudflare and just yes, start to see what happened. And there are days when I have five, six thousand bots, five, six thousand bots trying to do something to my blog or post something. So it's a strange world we live in for sure. Um, yeah, simple that. So let's see what else. Do you have a script to clear the update KBs after they have been downloaded to avoid drive getting a full? Uh, I do not, but Brian Dam has one. Um, he's running the damn good admin site. And I linked to it on this post here. I'm making sure I give you that one. Uh, 
And let's see, Brian. Yes. This script has been updated since the 2017 release. So uh, this is a script that helps you uh, clean out your, your packages or update packages and also to merge your various software update groups. So a lot of organizations they're building like monthly software update groups and then they merge it by the end of the year. This script can help you do things like that. So really good solution. Uh, by, by Mr. Uh, Brian here. Um, and then, of course, we have also Jeff. So if I go back to my blog, where have I put it? Good Lord. Ah. He, Jeff has a, a clean up script as well. I'm just going to double check that that link works still. Yeah, sure does. What I like about this script is you can run it in a what if mode. So if I, if I run it on my site server here, uh, let's see. Uh, no. I can run it in a trial mode by specifying trial run true. And this little script will give me an idea on, on how bad my environment is. And it's not very good at all, this particular lab. As you can see here, I have 500 some updates that are superseded and older than 90 days, they can be deleted. I have 460 some ARM updates. I don't even have any ARM machines at, the, at this moment. There are 50 some preview updates. Do I need those? No, I don't do that in this lab. So I can just run this script without the trial run, trial run false, and it's now gonna do a head and, and clean up stuff. So the community is good there. I kind of wish there was better maintenance in built in into config manager for WSUS, but there isn't. Uh, you basically have three checkboxes in the uh, maintenance tab that that's it. Uh, if I go to my software update uh, point here, um, This is it. It would be nice to get like a complete additional management layer on top of this. But for now, you have to deal with PowerShell script that the community puts together to do additional cleanup of all your uh, software active groups, whatever you might have in your environment. So it all depends. All right, any other questions? We have a whooping nine minutes to go. Or to use. Or to have coffee. Mm -hmm. Uh, what is Windows ARM 64 used for? That is for, for Windows of ARMS, basically, for those of you uh, having those, that hardware. Um, I believe the most common one, I guess it's the Surface Pro X that is still on ARM, if I remember correctly. Uh, good Lord. Uh, again, it has... Yeah. It was not a Samsung device. But um, yeah, 
to run Windows on ARM devices. And that's what those updates are for, uh, obviously. The only thing Microsoft usually don't like is that you deploy image yourself to these devices. <laughs> it's usually the, uh, it's like, well, it's like in a better type setup where the idea is that the OEM should do it, but there is nothing that prevents you from, from deploying ARM to this. Uh, so. answer that question. Uh, follow up to my uh, upgrade uh, version. Do you have any post on that? Uh, I do have uh, a pretty extensive guide available for download. Uh, it's a 70 some pages ebook. Um, I think you have it copy here somewhere I can show. Uh, find it. I should do it. This is like an end-to-end -end deployment guide. Uh, I'm working, by the way, on a Windows 11 version with this one also, but this one does have all the steps that you need to set up Config Manager for OSD, and it will take you uh, through the entire uh, setup of, of getting a sequence up and ready to do uh, updates from it. Um, I will also added some instructions on how to improve what comes with config manager by default. I don't like to use a single sequence. I actually prefer to split it up in multiple sequences where I have one sequences that has the validation and pre-caching or content. Then I have a second one that actually does the upgrade and this guide will take you through that kind of setup. So it, it's fairly detailed, uh, a lot of the screenshots and step-by-step -step guidance on, on how to do things. So that would be a good start. All right, any other questions? We have four more minutes. Marking the ones answered that I actually have answered. Just make sure I don't miss anyone. or spam in the YouTube channel, fantastic. Let's see any new ones. All right, we are going to go ahead and uh, publish the dates for uh, the office hours for January. Uh, it's still going to be on Wednesdays, and I'm still going to run a few of them in the evenings and a few of them in the mornings to make sure that people both in, in the US and in Europe and, and uh, even Australia actually uh, have at least a fighting chance to be able to attend them without having to stay up until midnight. So that will post it here uh, shortly, uh, those dates. But other than that, uh, thank you so much for joining today. Thank you for all the good questions. And I hope to see you guys uh, next year. And that leads me to Happy New Year, everyone. Thank you so much.